Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 538 of the podcast and it is Tuesday the 9th of March 2021 as I record this. So in today's in between episode, I'm talking to Simon-Pierre Marion about blockchain for authors and publishing. And yes, he's French-Canadian and you'll get to hear his lovely accent soon. Now, we start by briefly explaining blockchain and why you can think of it more like an architecture, the technology that will underpin the next stage of selling online, what it brings to publishing and authors, the possibilities of smart contracts, including resale of ebooks, audiobooks, digital things and estate management, which is something a lot of us think about. Then we talk about digital scarcity and why it is such a fundamental mindset shift for authors. And because NFTs, which are essentially representing digital scarcity, are in the news right now, what I have done is I've inserted some extra comment. So at around 23, I guess, 25 minutes in, uh, in the middle of the interview, I will come in and add extra comments because that's when we talk about it. And then we'll return to talk about BookChain, which is uh, a new way of publishing books. And I have used it to publish a book on the Ethereum blockchain and a look ahead about how the industry might shift into using blockchain technology in the coming years. So if you don't know anything about this, then listen all the way through. If you do know stuff about this, then you could probably uh, skip the first five minutes or 10 minutes as we cover the basics. But uh, I think this is so important and it is a real mindset shift for authors and the publishing industry. I heard Simon Pierre speak at Frankfurt Book Fair in 2019 and it was really that talk that made me realise what a big deal this is. And it was, in, as we, we'll talk about it, but it was in this tiny, tiny corner of the fair. There were only a few people in the audience. And by the end of the session, I was sitting there like a, we, we say a stunned mullet here in, in England. I was like a stunned mullet sitting there going, whoa, this is huge. Why is there nobody here? Why do people not realise how big a deal this is? They should be speaking on the main stage. This is revolutionary technology for what we do. Now, Simon Pierre <laughs> talks about how slow the adoption is, but also how it's been sort of, again, accelerated by the pandemic and that is very likely to be implemented like a new form of architecture. But in terms of protecting intellectual property, cutting costs in the back office, estate management, transparency about payments, faster payments, collaboration. There are so many possibilities with this and an expanding range of rights licensing opportunities and an expanding possibility for revenue models, which of course is what we're interested in. So if you want some more background uh, and ideas, obviously I have a whole chapter on this in my artificial intelligence blockchain and copyright book. And you can listen to episode 519, which is an excerpted chapter, which also it ca covers slightly different things around copyright law and blockchain specifically. Now, as I, <laughs> I, I really am excited about this, and it's great to talk to Simon Pierre, who is just as excited as I am. In fact, more so, he started a business around this. So I hope you enjoy the interview, and I'll be back in the middle with my comment on NFTs. Simon-Pierre Marion is the CEO and founder of Cinerex, a Canadian company that builds blockchain publishing solutions. Their site, bookchain.ca, enables authors and publishers to publish on the Ethereum blockchain. Welcome, Simon-Pierre. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you for your invitation. I'm uh, super happy to participate. It's very exciting to talk about this. But before we get into the details, just tell us a bit more about you and why you decided to focus on this intersection of publishing and technology. Yes, actually, I, it started in 2013, a long time ago already. I started my MBA at that time, an MBA that is specialized in technology. 
and the, the digital publishing world. I was very interested in it uh, because I'm a big reader, a uh, big fan of books, of course, but I'm a very uh, tech-savvy guy, so I like digital books a lot more than the regular book. Maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm the opposite of uh, a lot of people of my generation, but that's what I am. So being interested in that, I started to study uh, that uh, domain because I was wondering why digital books were not more advanced than than that. I was comparing the, uh, the music industry to the movie industry, and I was saying that they were far more advanced uh, in the digital world compared to the, the books. So basically, over the years, I I realized that blockchain could bring a lot to the digital world of the book uh, publishing industry. From that, I decided to start Cenarex in 2015. I, I studied the market uh, a lot the first two years in 2015 and 16. And then after that, I realized that there was a, a need for uh, publisher and authors to benefit from the blockchain. And I, I decided to start the uh, blockchain project. And it's so fascinating that you've been focusing on the blockchain specific stuff since 2015, because I, I feel like a lot of people may have only just started to hear about it in a more serious way. So let's start at the basic level. I feel like people hear Bitcoin and blockchain and they might think it's the same thing. So can you briefly explain blockchain? And also for people listening, you don't need to understand it technically in order to use it. I think that's really important. But just yes. briefly explain uh, what it is. So the the picture I always uh, refer to is to use it or, or to refer it as a general ledger. So if you take, for example, a, an accountant, he records in a general ledger, in a book, all the transactions. So a blockchain technology acts a little bit like that. So it's like a big book where you store all of the information from trans transactions that are happening. And when I say a big book here, you have to realize that we are talking about a, a digital world. So it's, it's a, in fact, a database, which is a system where, where you store data. So in a nutshell, that's what a blockchain is. It's a, a database where you store information. The, the, the interesting aspect, though, of blockchain is that you cannot modify it. It cannot be tampered with. So as when you record a transaction in a blockchain, it's there forever. It cannot be it cannot be act or change or or delete. It's there. It's there. I guess in terms of the currency, it's just a, a payment system built on blockchain uh, database, for example. Yeah. So so often people uh, think that uh, cryptocurrency is blockchain, or blockchain is cryptocurrency. <laughs> But that is not true. The cryptocurrency is a system that uses blockchain technology in order to make it work. But blockchain was invented uh, before cryptocurrency. The guy who invi invi invented cryptocurrency uh, and the Bitcoin simply realized that blockchain was the perfect technology to, to bring his idea to life because it brought the security around it. If you purchase a cryptocurrency, you want it to be safe and you don't want people to be able to steal uh, your cryptocurrency. So blockchain was the perfect perfect approach for them. And that's also why the reason why now all the major uh, banks in the world are looking at uh, blockchain uh, and most of them are already starting project in blockchain because they are also acknowledging that blockchain is a very secure approach for, for doing financial transactions uh, digitally. I try and say to people, it's a bit like the internet. You don't have to know how the internet works to use the internet. We're getting to the point where a lot of things are going to work on blockchain, like on the internet. You use the internet for all kinds of things, but you PayPal is for a certain payments part of the internet. And so I think using similarities to help people understand it so and of course on digital currencies i think Ch china is uh, now actually launched their digital currency and there's rumors of an amazon digital one and obviously facebook and, facebook yes yeah yes. so 
these are all things that are going to become much more normal to talk about uh, mm -hmm. as as time goes on. But let's talk about publishing specifically. So you mentioned that you saw that music and film was way ahead of publishing. <laughs> and I, I totally agree with you. But why are you so excited about blockchain technology for transforming the publishing industry? So uh, for the publishing industry, blockchain is, uh, is super well suited that's why in my intro, I was telling you that I was studying the publishing industry and the blockchain technology, and I realized that they were perfect match. And the reason why they are perfect match is because uh, in a blockchain, you can have transactions, but those transactions can also be used to store a digital asset and to ensure that the digital asset is assigned to the proper owner. If you're a publisher or an author and you want to publish your book, you want to make sure that everyone knows that it, it's your book. You are the author or you are the publisher of that book and you have the rights or the copyrights to that book. So in that sense, blockchain is perfect because you can use blockchain to record that you are the rightful owner of that book. And it will be there, and it will start be it will be safe there, and no one can ever um, contradict you because you are the rightful owner of of that book. And if you go after the next step, is that if I am a reader and I want to purchase a book, then as a reader, when I purchase my book, I want to make sure that this book now belongs to me, that copy of that book, let's say, belongs to me. Of course, the, the copyright remains to the, the author and the publisher. But you, as a customer, you have purchased a copy of the book. And now on the blockchain, it, the transaction is recorded. So now you are the owner of a, a copy of a book and you have the right to read that book. And of course, the rightful owner of the book remains the rightful owner of the book, which is the author and the publisher. But the, the reader can now say, yes, I am an, the owner of a copy and I can prove it using blockchain technology. So it really, I, I won't say solves the problems of copyright and digital piracy, but it certainly goes in the right direction. And when I saw you at Frankfurt in 2019, you were presenting alongside a new copyright group that are looking at a sort of ISBN number for blockchain. Yes. And that's, I know a lot of that is out of Canada as well. Maybe you could talk a bit about that too. Yes, so there are other projects ongoing, especially for that, to make sure that uh, we can assign um, a number to a digital asset using the blockchain technology. And using that number uh, with algorithm that would identify the source of the digital asset, it would be like a stamps of, of proof that this is the original, let's say, digital copy of the book. And if anyone tries to add a new of that book, then the blockchain technology would automatically know that it is a someone trying to add the same book or a copy of that book because of its digital footprint or fingerprint, if you if you might say so. So mm -hmm. that's another very good example of how blockchain technology could be used to replace the uh, ISBN number or maybe not replace it because there's also needs for it in the uh, physical world. But it could be a complement to the ISBN for the digital version of the books. We should say that, like this is, as you say, digital. So this could work for audiobooks as well. And and oh, for, yes, yeah. And for me, it would really help because at the moment, a lot of us get emails from Amazon saying if somebody else is claiming this book, give us proof of that you own this book of your copyright. And it's very annoying because, of course, you know you've registered and you, but people do this. And if there was that kind of electronic registration that could be more easily checked, then these big uh, publishing distributors could check that and we wouldn't have to go through this and I think it would really help with a lot of the the piracy issues which which I think is is quite exciting like it must be exciting to the publishing industry to think this could happen or do they just not care <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, I I think it's you know what the the COVID um, has is bad side, but unfortunately, maybe, let's say it like that. Unfortunately, it's also has some good side. I think some of the good side is that we've seen a a big uh, increase in the the digital publishing world. And now I think uh, a lot of people, a lot of publishers that were um, less inclined to go on the digital uh, aspect of uh, things are more and more now with the COVID going through there. And we've seen an increase in their interest in knowing about the different technologies that are on the market. And I think it's helping our cause of promoting the blockchain technology. Oh, that is good to know, because I remember coming to your session at Frankfurt Book Fair and it was in this tiny corner of the fair and I was listening to you. There were only maybe six of us in the audience that weren't part of your group. And I was sitting there listening to it going, this is really significant. Why is there no one else here? Like, why is this not on the main stage? So (laughs) I'm, I'm really happy to hear that things are changing. But let's get into some more interesting details. So Let's talk about the smart contract. So let's say we've got our digital asset, we've uploaded our book to um, the blockchain, and we'll come back to bookchain.ca in a bit. But what is a smart contract and what are the possibilities that authors could include in it? That's also one of the very cool things about blockchain, Um, the smart contract. So let's let's start from the basics. So what's a contract? A contract is when... Uh, you sign a deal with someone and there are rules in the contract. So in the publishing uh, uh, industry, let's say you you have a contract with a uh, marketplace and in your contract, okay, you say that your book will be sold at that price and from that price, the marketplace will retain 30% and then give you the rest and, and, and so on and so on. There could be multiple different rules. So when you talk about smart contract, So what you do is that you take the rules from that contract and you automate those rules using program or using development in the blockchain. So it's it's basically it's code that transforms those rules to be automated. So what does that mean is that after that, if you use a smart contract and you have a transaction that happens on the blockchain, let's say you sell a book, then the smart contract will automatically apply those rules for you. So you don't have to worry about it. It's it's there and it will be done. So for example, if you said my book uh, is sold at this price, then the, the smart contract will make sure that it is sold at the right price. If you said that uh, the uh, royalties, uh, the marketplace gets 30% and you get the rest, then the smart contract will make sure that this the money is split automatically for you and of course if there are other rules it will apply all of the rules for you so that's very very cool because you don't have to worry about anything everything is done automatically for you what i think is exciting about this because i think authors will be going well you know that happens right now but you're talking about at the time of transaction rather than 60 days later which we get right now for example from what I I can tell. And the idea is that, so for example, I might have 50% of it goes to me and 10% goes straight to charity and 20% goes to my brother. And essentially you could program all of these things in and that will happen as long as that asset is transacted on the blockchain. So I'm also excited about this, about estate management. So essentially this could go on even after the death of the author. Am, Am I right about that? Yes, exactly. So that, that uh, you're absolutely right. The royalty distribution can be split as you want, as you wish with a smart contract. It can do whatever you want and it will do it automatically as soon as there is a transaction. So that's the, the beauty of it. The other thing is this idea of ebook resale. And this is something I was talking about with a guy in the Netherlands, uh, Tom's Cabinet, but the, the court came down in Europe to say that you can't resell an ebook. But that seems to be because of the licensing agreements that most yes. of the, the ebook retailers have. So, what makes it possible to resale ebooks? And if we have a smart contract in place, can we get a cut of a resale? Absolutely. So to to be able to resell an ebook, you have to make it clear for 
the royalty owners uh, uh, of the book. Of course, if you try to resell an ebook and the royalty owners or, or the copyright owners of the book do not want uh, the ebook to be resell, of course, you're going to lose it in any course. But for example, in our solution, what we are saying is that we ask the the rightful owner of the book if they want their ebook to be resellable or not and they take the decision if they accept or not this uh, this uh, state of resell uh, if they do not accept then it won't be able it, people won't be able to resell it but if they do accept then the ebook can be resell and of course it's it, this is all again stored in the smart contract so if you accept that a reader resells his books, then you can also set in the smart contract what are the percentage um, for the distribution of the resale transaction. So if you say, okay, I, I will let my uh, readers resell their book, but when they will re they, re they will resell it, I want 50% out of it and I leave them the, the other 50%. So that's an example. But the other thing you can put uh, in the smart contract is the notion of time. So you could say, yeah, you know what? I would like to resell, to have that resell option enabled in the blockchain smart contract. But maybe not right now because I'm often my my sales are very high the first year and then after that they go down a little bit. So you can say, well, I will enable the resale after a year. So you can purchase the book, but then a year after uh, you cannot resell it. But a year after you the resell act option is activated, and then the reader can resell the book, and it, this could create a, another some market and other revenues for you. And that's exactly the point, more revenue for us. Yeah. And yeah. this is why when I've been hearing you talk about this, I've been reading a lot of books on this. I'm kind of blown away by the abundance of possibilities with things like the smart contracts. So this, as you, you mentioned, the banks are, are going to be using these things because it does away with the back office functions of payment splitting and sending out money, you know, and, and there's, there will be no excuse to have this sort of 30 day, 60 day, six months months, one year, <laughs> yes. if, if it can all be done in this way. And I think people hear ebook resale and they think that will take money out of their pocket. But actually, it finally means that creators and everyone else in the publishing chain can um, make revenue from the secondhand book market, which at the moment doesn't benefit anyone except the bookseller. And I love secondhand bookstores, but it would be great to digitalize that as well. Um, so you feel that abundance too, I guess. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. And the other thing I'm fascinated by is the idea of digital scarcity. And this is a huge idea. People listening, if you haven't heard of this. So essentially, you can do a limited edition. And in fact, as we speak this week, Christie's has just launched their first digital art auction, which indicates to me that digital um, scarcity is going mainstream. This to me is very exciting because we could do first digital editions or limited editions. So what are you excited about with digital? Digital scarcity and any, any thoughts on that? Yes, and, and, I, and this is such a, a, a good idea, you know, because that's exactly what we would like to create in the uh, digital publishing world is is to have that notion um, uh, of uh, a special edition of a book. And again, uh, the way I all often uh, approaching it to the major publishers. I'm telling them that they can create, again, new revenues. So that's often the, the key word here. So new revenues, and how can you do that? Is that, for example, you add a bestseller, you know, a book that was a bestseller, uh, but it's been a, a few years now and the, the book is not being sold um, anymore or very low sales. So from the, that bestseller, what you can do is you can turn it into a, a a collectible version of the book. So you can do a like a special cover, you can have a special uh, introduction by the authors, maybe the author will can will sign the digital book. Uh, you, so you can scan this signature and put it in the digital book. Maybe there will be an alternate ending. Maybe there will be some artwork in it. 
So you create that digital book, that, that special edition of it, and then you can, using blockchain technology again, you can say to the blockchain in the smart contract, this book, I want to have only that many copies of it in circulation. So you can control the number of books, uh, digital books that are uh, available to customer using uh, the smart contract and the blockchain. And of course, that's where also the resale uh, capability comes into play because you can also specify that this special edition uh, can be resale by the person who purchased it. And if the demand is for that special edition is very high and you, you kept the number low enough, uh, you can also create a market where the digital edition of your book can probably be sold uh, a lot more by the reader once uh, all of the copies are gone and that others want to purchase it. They could bid on it and they could resell it at a much higher price so they can do money out of it and you can also do money out of it. Yeah. And again, this is so exciting because at the moment, I feel like we don't value ebooks and digital audio enough because they're unlimited and they're essentially copies. And yes. we feel like, oh, well, you know, a couple of dollars here and there and everywhere. But this idea of scarcity and a collector's edition. And as you say, there are business models around the collectors who will wait to buy up these first editions, who will then resell them. And that is their business model is reselling uh, collector's editions in print and there's no reason why that can't work in digital and if people people won't believe it I know they're listening going no that'll never happen but I went on to superrare.co and it is happening with images and I'm like why is someone paying that much 300 euro for a pic little pixel image but it, it is happening isn't it that this there's a mindset shift yes exactly there there is a there, there, that the collectible market always existed and it will it will continue to exist. So the, the digital market needs to, to adapt to this market and blockchain is the perfect solution for it. Right, so here I am jumping back in mid-interview to add some extra commentary on NFTs since they are all over the news right now and fit nicely into this interview which we recorded uh, a, a month or so ago and uh, obviously it wasn't so much in the news. So NFT stands for non-fungible token which is just terrible really uh, and it's basically a verified digital asset. So it has like a, a certificate of verification and as we've been discussing in this interview you could have a first edition or a limited edition of an ebook or an audiobook. So I might decide, okay, I'm going to create five copies of this first edition ebook. I'm going to sign them digitally and verify that there are only five copies like this. And I create a smart contract that allows resale of those. And maybe I want 10% or 5% or 20% of every resale. I can determine that in the contract. Then the person who buys it can sell it on, do whatever they like with it. I might do the same with an audiobook. For example, I could add extra audio specific to each of those five audio things, or I could add audio to the ebook, special messages. Uh, you can still buy the regular ebook or audiobook for the usual price. You can also buy the print edition in paperback, hardback, large print. And maybe I also do a limited edition hardback with gold embossing and special art. And I want you to consider the digital possibilities to be similar to the physical possibilities in that people want different things. And they some people want collectors' digital items. There is no more race to the bottom with this idea. It means you can have, sure, you can have your one thing that is available everywhere, but some people will pay a lot more. In the print market, for example, you know, people will pay hundreds of thousands for a first edition of a physical book by an author and they can read the text free on the internet. I mean, it, that's not the thing. And uh, you might say, oh, well, it's a physical book. Yes, but the value of that physical book actually is tiny if you strip it down to pages and ink. The value is in the belief of what that means to that person. It's a real physical edition. And so I was thinking about some of the things that we could do as authors. For example, I was thinking of cutting up some of my actual journals and creating a piece of art using handwritten words. And it would exist 
once and I would include those in the digital first editions of whichever book I decided to launch with an NFT. So a real digital limited edition with extra word art in. I was also thinking about including pages of the hand edited draft, which I keep. So after I write my first draft, I print it out and then I scribble all over it. So maybe you would get part of the early draft covered with my handwritten scrawls. And I have visited handwritten scrawled pages in the British Library. And again, yes, they're physical, but again, you have to change your mindset around what people value. So Thomas Hardy's Tessa the D'Urbervilles is in there, Beat the Beatles lyrics for Help or one of the big songs anyway. And what we're talking about is, yes, it's a digital edition, but people want to own these things. And this is why it's different too. It's actual ownership. So at the moment, you don't own the ebooks on your Kindle or Apple books or whatever. Uh, You don't own the TV shows that you stream and the music on Spotify. You're paying for a license. They can cancel your contract and you lose access to it all immediately. With NFTs, you own that copy and that creates a far more interesting secondhand and collector's market. You can also use tokens, these tokens for things in real life. So the band, Kings of Leon, as reported in Rolling Stone, are using different kinds of tokens. Some include a special album package, so digital. Others are front row seats at a live event and others for exclusive audiovisual art. So you can package all kinds of things. I mean, maybe think about this more as like a Kickstarter where all the rewards are digital. Now, you might think this is crazy. (laughs) You might be like, what are people doing? There are a lot of big numbers being talked about in the media, like multi millions of dollars for music tracks or a digital clip of someone, you know, dunking a basketball and uh, all these kind of different things, um, artworks that you can just download for free, selling for multi millions, even uh, a tweet, for example, by Jack Dorsey. But I know people, I actually know people, real people who use sites like Second Life, who will pay serious amounts of money for a designer dress for their avatar to wear online. And if you watch Ready Player One or read the book, you can see how the digital virtual reality world may go. People pay real money for digital assets. And the amazing thing for us, even if you don't personally care about paying money for digital assets yourself, Lots of people want to, (laughs) so we should be pleasing them. And you can create a smart contract for getting a cut of the resale. So examples include have a look at Nifty Gateway and superrare.co as examples of art. For me, this is true digital abundance and the possibilities are incredible, especially for independent creators who want to expand their forms of income. There are not many authors who could command that amount right now, so I'm not going to be able to put up one of my uh, you know, NFT ebooks with extra handwritten words in and get six million for it. As much as I would love to think you guys would like that, it's not going to happen. But I want you to think about what we do with these different formats at the moment. So when I launch a book, uh, so, you know, next week as this goes out, I'll be putting out How to Make a Living with Your Writing, the third edition. That will go out in ebook, audio back, audio back, audio book, paperback, large print, hardback, workbook editions. That's six editions. Uh, Well, five editions plus a workbook because the workbook just contains the questions. But I'm already doing all of those editions. What I could also do, of course, I could do a limited edition hardback with gold embossing. I always use that because that's quite expensive or foil or whatever you want to add to the the cover. Uh, Or I could also include these digital first editions or something like that. Now, the technology, it's all sort of invite only at the moment. So I'm not going to be able to do that right now, but it's definitely something I'm looking at. And even if you think that, okay, if you think about the products I've just mentioned, the price is ranging between sort of $6.99 and say $25 for the hardback. So what that means is that I, even if I had a $100 digital first edition, that's a $100. That's you know, four times what I could get for a hardback. And then what about getting money from that over time from the resale, which I could not get from a hardback. So in fact, even if I sold a digital first edition for $25 and then someone onsold that, onsold that for the life of copyright, I could get money or my estate could get money for all that time. (laughs) You just think, 
Wow, that is amazing. I really hope you're getting this. I, I hope you're, the penny is dropping for you because when it dropped for me, I'm like, oh my goodness, there are so many things we could do. It means we could collaborate much more and do real limited edition things between us. And uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> my brain explodes with the possibilities ahead of us creatives if you own and control your intellectual property rights, it's going to be possibly, you know, we always say this is the best time in history to be a writer. Well, it's going to get even better. That's how I feel about this. I'm that excited. And this is why you should never license all formats existing now and to be invented as you basically have cut out this entire future. Um, so please don't sign contracts like that. Um, license specific formats, specific languages, specific territories and specific timeframes. <laughs> I just wanted to read a comment from Scott Belsky, the author of Making Ideas Happen, who has a great um, post on Medium about this, which I'll link to in the show notes. He says he calls this a transformative economic model for artists and says it's empowering the careers of creators themselves more than everyone in the middle. This is another way to go direct to fans uh, in new ways. Uh, he ends with, welcome to the new era of digital art, or we could say digital books, one that finally transcends the traditional lowest common denominator aspects of the web and both elevates and rewards some of the greatest artists the world has ever seen and the rest of us. <laughs> As always, art and creative experimentation more broadly is just the bridge between the old way and a better way. So much more to come in this space. And this is how I feel. I feel like we've seen ebooks version one. Well, probably we're in version two. Version one was uh, people scanned PDFs of things and that was, you know, an ebook. But that's what, so we're in version two, which is, you know, EPUBs and Mobies and files that move and things like that. But what we're talking about here is perhaps the new thing. So as he said, the bridge between the old way and a better way. And I see we'll be moving into this new space where we can do digital assets that are not a race to the bottom. And boy, do we need it. We really need it. So uh, Hugh Howey's also posted about this and goes in a lot into a lot more detail around piracy and also the environmental impacts. He says, in the future, there will be a secondhand market for digital art that includes the artist in every transaction. Hugh is just as excited about this as I am. Now, of course, there are valid criticisms of NFTs and cryptocurrency and blockchain around the amount of power it takes to produce these transactions. But this problem will be solved. I absolutely believe it will be solved. And if you carry on listening to the interview with Simon Pierre, he talks about when this will move into the mainstream. And we are still a few years off as yet. And of course, this will be normal just as, you know, uploading your ebook is normal now, whereas it wasn't a decade ago. Uh, this will be normal. So it's definitely coming. And once the penny drops for you on the possibilities, I hope you will be just as excited as we are. So let's get back into the interview. So tell us a bit more about what bookchain.ca does and what authors can do with their books there. So yeah, so bookchain... Uh says it's a blockchain-based platform that we have developed to help authors publish their book on the blockchain because it's not easy right now to, to do that without a, the proper interface. If you can picture it, we, we basically build a layer on top of, of a, a blockchain technology, which is the Ethereum blockchain, in order to simplify the work of authors and publisher in order to put their work uh, or their books on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it's very uh, very simple interface. The authors or publishers they simply create an account. They upload. Uh, they fill, of course, some some uh, profile information. They upload their book. They are they create uh, their smart contract, and then after that they can publish it, and then the book becomes available to readers to be uh, purchased. When we build blockchain, what we had in mind is to is to help, of course, authors and publishers to publish their books on the blockchain. But it was also uh, with the idea that we want to give as much as we can back to them. So we, we are not collecting very high fees 
of course, we have some fees uh, in, and like any other <laughs> platform, you need to, you have operating fees, but we try to keep it as much as possible, as low as possible in order to give as much back as possible to the authors and the, the publishers. Mm, and of course, I've uploaded a book there and I can say it is pretty similar to the other distributors that we all use. You need the same fields. Obviously, you're always going to need yes. title and description yeah. and here's the book file and that kind of thing. But obviously, one difference, as we've talked about, is the smart contract area where you can specify certain things. And I know you're working on adding things like the resale and, and stuff like that. I did have one question around a payment currency. So you've chosen to pay authors with fiat currency, as in real world currency. Uh, and I wondered why not use cryptocurrency, for example, Ether for Ethereum blockchain, since that's what you've built on. So the authors can actually earn crypto, which many authors would, would might like to do in, in this uh, new world as such. Yes. And really, it was a development decision at the beginning, uh, simply because we were seeing that the market was not there right now. So it's like it, the percentage of people owning cryptocurrency or wanted to use cryptocurrency was not high enough for us to uh, to do this development. We will, could not justify the cost of the development to integrate that right now versus the need of it. But uh, the, the the good thing out of blockchain is that it's already on the Ethereum uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, and if suddenly the demand would switch and people more and more wanted to use cryptocurrency, it would be a lot more easier for us to activate that than other uh, type of platform that that are not integrated into a blockchain uh, solution right now. I mean, obviously, I'm in the UK and I my main currency is GBP, uh, Great British Pounds. But I do a lot of business in US dollars and I like getting paid in US dollars into my PayPal so that I can pay other people in US dollars without having to go through various exchange rates. So for me, it's like I like the idea of earning uh, cryptocurrency so that I can then use it to buy other things with that same currency. So I consider myself a sort of multi-currency business, even though it's just me. <laughs> but I, I see what your your point that the, there are many options for, for the future. But I, I also wanted to talk about the bigger issue of getting this adopted within the publishing ecosystem, because I see, like you mentioned, it's not easy right now for people to get stuff on Ethereum blockchain or any other blockchain. And so what you've done is built uh, an app or a layer, a, a, a company on top of the architecture. And what I see is as an author, I make most of my money through very big sites like Amazon and Apple and Kobo. And I want to publish a smart contract and, and publish my book on blockchain and then have that go through to all these platforms. And then that contract would carry all the way through the ecosystem. So is that something that you see as a possibility or will Amazon build their own blockchain solution and we'll have to upload to lots of different ones? How do you see this going in the next five years? That's also our strategy. So when we build BookChain, we wanted to be able to benefit authors and publishers that wants to go through us directly. But we always had in mind that the end state of BookChain was going to be a, an open platform that other marketplace or uh, other distributor could also use and make a, a, and and use it for protecting their digital uh, books. So we are not looking for uh, replacing Amazon. <laughs> we are not re looking to replace anyone. We, we are looking to um, convince them to integrate them into our technology so they can benefit out of it. Even if it's with white labels, we're not looking at conquering the world with, with, that, with the brand. <laughs> you know, we are looking at making sure that uh, we will be there for the anyone in the market that wants to use that technology simplified by us um, and not have to spend all of the uh, research and development budget that we've spent to build it. 
So that's, I think, the future for BookTrain. And that's what we are aiming to, is to make sure that people will use it. So you might, in five years from now, maybe everyone will use it and you won't maybe even know it but it will be used. (laughs) That's brilliant then, because of course, at the moment, people can buy uh, eBooks on bookchain.ca. They can actually buy them there. But my thought was, well, I'm not going to direct people there because people shop on the places they shop, you know, but that makes, I'm so glad that you said that and you shared that because I felt the same way. I felt like, oh, this is, you're more like a distributor, a bit like um, draft to digital or Publish Drive. You know King at Publish Drive. Um, I saw yes. you together at a, on, yes. on a video <laughs> online <Yes. laughs> at Digital Book World, I think. And um, yes, yeah, so being a distributor, as you say, where an author might load their books up and then you distribute them through that, that would be exactly what I would see as, as the future, which is really exciting. But so what are the challenges in convincing people? What, what are the mindset issues you're coming up against within authors and publishing? There's a, a lot of fear because the technology is not well known still. So there's a lot of fear. And I often compare that fear to what it was at the late or mid 90s to late 90s uh, with internet. This tells you a, b- a bit about my age. So I'm, I'm not too young. So I was, <laughs> I was in the middle of, of that phase in the 90s with internet. But, uh, and, and I was already in, in technology at that time. And I, I remember it was this, the exact same pattern that I was seeing with internet because at that in the mid 90s, I was telling companies, oh, wow, you have to start selling your stuff on the internet. This is the future. And then big uh, corporation were telling me, ah, oh, you know what? No, we're, I, I think it's not safe. People don't want to put their credit card on the internet and, and so on and so on and so on. But then there was a, a, a complete shift after that. And as soon as people really started to adopt internet, it, it really boomed and suddenly everyone, now, I mean, you cannot even imagine our world without internet. So we are seeing the exact same pattern with blockchain technology. As as technical technological people, we know the potential of the blockchain technology. We know it's super secure. We know what it can bring to to the publishing industry. But the again, the big corporation or the big players are are still a bit uh, scared about it. But I think it's just a question of time be- before it goes completely the other way and we-, we will see a big boom with the blockchain technology as we've seen with the internet technology. Yes, and um, I see that, uh, I mean, Spotify uh, for music, obviously, and, and Amazon ha- are looking at these types of solutions. And I feel like it has to be, I, I don't think the publishers, you know, the traditional publishers are going to do it first. I think it's going to be demanded of them by yes. by these big platforms. And they'll say, well, you can't sell on this platform unless we can be sure of your copyright. So you have to go through this this way. Is, is that, would that be the, the way it might go? Yes, absolutely. That's a, a very plausible thing that can happen in the future. It can, it can be drive definitively by the, the big marketplace. Facebook is one of them, as we were saying earlier, Facebook. Facebook marketplace is gaining uh, in popularity. They are integrating cryptocurrency. So they are already using also blockchain technology. So for sure, I'm pretty sure that those retailers will probably do a big push for blockchain technology to the publishers. Yes. And as you say, it may be that we're talking about an architecture that people won't even discuss. They'll be like, yes, I've uploaded my book to Amazon and that we won't even know that it's using blockchain. So that's really interesting to me. This really is a an architecture, but we will use the apps or the programs on top of the architecture. So a lot of it will be seamless anyway. So do, do you think authors even need to know about this stuff? <laughs> so so it, it's a bit like you were saying at the beginning, you know, with the with internet, you don't necessarily need to know exactly how it works underneath it because there will be companies like us that will provide 
the infrastructure or the interfaces to for you to be able to to use the technology without even knowing uh, that you are that you are using it. Last question. You mentioned there that it's a bit like the fear in the mid nineties. Do you, that was like twenty five years ago. You, do you think it will take that long to adopt all of this, or, or what? What's your pick? I mean, you've been working on this for uh, well since twenty thirteen. Your MBA in twenty fifteen with the company. Um, have you got a sort of date when you'd like to see this going mainstream? Yeah. So, so it really, it, internet really picked up after ten years when it started to be more commercial commercialized because it was existing before but it was not uh, for the general public a bit like uh, a bit like blockchain but uh, it really started the, in the beginning of the 90s and it really boomed in the beginning of the 2000s I, I don't know if you remember there was that yes, technological yeah. bubble <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so i was really aiming at 10 years i started in 2015 ex- exactly for that reason because my um, my estimation is that it will start booming in the around the the 2025. So I don't have a crystal ball here. <laughs> I'm just I'm just taking the the pattern that uh, I've seen in the past, and it it's taking generally like a, a, for a, a a big change a, a big change uh, technology like that. It takes around 10 years. So my estimation is that, yes, blockchain technology will take a a 10 year as well before booming like internet. So 2025 is really the key year for blockchain. Excellent. Well, I'm excited and I hope to see you again at Frankfurt, but on one of the big stages with a whole (laughs) load of people in the audience instead of nobody. So, So where can people find you and Bookchain online? So yeah, so you, you can go at the uh, www.bookchain.ca or they can visit our uh, company uh, site as well at cenarex.ca or .com. So it's S-C-E-N-A-R-E-X.ca or .com. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Simon Pierre and my extra comments on NFTs. I would love to know what you think about this. Uh, how mad do you think we are? Uh, or do you agree? And are you excited? And what ideas do you have around the possibilities for what we could create with these ideas of digital limited editions? So please do leave a comment on the show notes. You can always find them at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. This is episode number 538, or it's on the thecreativepen.com forward slash blog if it's uh, if you're listening to this in the right week. You can also tweet me at the creative pen or you can email me joanna at the creative pen.com. I really want us to come up with great ideas around this. My goal with these extra shows is to delve further into what's coming so we can surf the change and not drown in it. And with these possibilities hopefully make a ton more money from our intellectual property assets exciting times creatives. So back to the usual format on Monday's show when I'll be talking about how to be successful publishing on Kobo Writing Life with Tara Kremen. So we're back to the now (laughs) and we talk about international publishing, book marketing tips and more. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>